All right, everybody, this is the second time we're going to try to go live today. <laughs> My name is Kendra, and I am joined by author Lisa Turkhurst, and we are talking all about the It's Not Supposed to Be This Way teaching series. That's and right. We are so excited to join you. And so we're on our main Facebook page, and we are going to give you guys a sneak peek into Lisa's message today. And then if you hear something you like or maybe you want to learn more about it, we'll go ahead and post the link where you can learn more. And then we're also in our community group, and you get to see behind the scenes. And we are always happy to see you guys there as well. So we're going to go ahead and go live so those that called in can hear what's going on, and we will get this teaching series going so let's do it everybody wonderful i'm super excited about this all right so hey everyone and welcome to week one of our it's not supposed to be this way teaching series my name is kendra and i am the manager of online bible studies and i am joined by author speaker president of proverbs 31 lisa turkhurst and we are happy to have you as our first guest on this teaching series thanks so much kendra it's really an honor to be able to spend the few minutes of just personal time. Yeah. Let's look at it as instead of this being my part of the teaching series, which it is, but I just like to think of it as personal time. Like if we were gathered around my kitchen table today, this is what I'd want to share. Oh, I love that. I love that. So we are excited because Lisa and I got together with our teams and we came up with this concept for this teaching series. And it's all about when you might look up to the sky and being like, this is not the way I thought my life would turn out. This is not the way the circumstance was supposed to turn out. And so, Lisa, you gathered some of your friends together to give some messages. And so we get a little glimpse into your life, maybe um, a disappointment or a part of brokenness that you are now being restored in and just mm -hmm. showing us how to get to the point of restoration. Thank you. Yes. So, Lisa, I'm going to have to toss it to you, and we're going to have a little chat, like you said. Okay, perfect. Well, it's probably no surprise we're going to turn to Genesis chapter 2 because even though I wrote about this, I even spoke about it in the some of the videos that we'll be watching through online Bible study, which by the way, it's such a gift. Shout out to HarperCollins Christian Publishing yes. for allowing us to for free stream each week's video. Um, without charging anyone yeah. and it, it can only stream for a week and then it'll be taken down but in some of the videos you will hear some of this Genesis teaching but I want to really zero in on a couple of verses that I think are very very important so if you have your Bible and you want to open up to Genesis chapter 2 I'm gonna give you a couple of verses that I really want to um, have you either underline in your Bible write in your notes or some way mark it so that you can go back and really consider some of the things that we're saying. The first is um, Genesis chapter 2, and let's go to verse 16. And in verse 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man. Now, before we even go any further, I want to say it's really important that we acknowledge up to this point God has spoken but this is the first time in Genesis 2 that he is speaking directly to this treasured creation that he's made in mankind. It's also important to note that I think a lot of times when people think about creation story, they assume that when God gave this commandment, he was speaking to both the man and the woman. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. It was just the man that was there. Um, and then one other thing, I really want you to intentionally listen to what God reveals about his purpose in giving this command in the words of the command itself. So let's, let's, let's observe all of that, but really specifically listen to the words. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So, what are the first three words that God speaks here to the man? You, you are, free. are free. Okay, so this is really important to note because this sets a purpose for the command that may be opposite from what we feel mm -hmm. when we get a restriction in our life because this command contains a certain restriction. But we can better understand the purpose of the restriction when we understand the purpose of the command, keeping it all in context. The purpose of the restriction wasn't so that God would be a killjoy God. The purpose of the restriction was truly for Adam's protection. 
My friend Levi Lesko often says, anytime we hear God say, do not, we really should hear, do not hurt yourself. Mm. And I know I say that on one of the teaching videos, but I think that this is really yeah. important. So God is speaking in a language of freedom here. And I think it's also interesting if we think about of all the first words that God could have chosen to speak to the man, mm -hmm. to give to humankind, mankind, um, I think it's interesting his first three words are, you are free. Absolutely. And I think we probably have lost the realization of how much God wants his people walking in freedom. Mm -hmm. So it's in that context that God says, you must not eat from this one tree, the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. And uh, if you do, the consequences are severe. So let's read it one more time. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. So he's setting up completely free, like you're free to eat from all these trees in the garden, which by the way, I used to think, is it kind of cruel for God to say, but don't eat from this one mm -hmm. tree. But if you read earlier, when the trees are first acknowledged in, um, I believe it's verse nine, the Lord God made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. You see all the trees had elements to them that were very appealing. So this wasn't a cruel restriction, you know, God's saying, I have provided plenty for right. you all around, but there is this one tree. You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. You see, within this, God is saying, I'm giving this restriction, but it's for your protection. Um, and he's telling him there are consequences already built into the sin. Mm -hmm. In other words, Sin, and I think this is going to be a really important shift we need to make in our thinking of sin. Sin is both a combination of pleasure, mm -hmm. that's what attracts us to yeah. want to consider the sin and stepping outside of a uh, command that God gave us. So there is pleasure there, but the suffering is also built into the sin. Mm -hmm. It is a package deal, and I think we get that when we dig deeper into this very first command that God gave. God said, here's the deal. I want you walking in freedom. So God is speaking to us in a language of freedom. And you can eat. You have the freedom to eat so much. Here are all these amazing trees with fruit that's just as appealing mm -hmm. as this one tree. But there is this one tree that contains inside the fruit the knowledge mm. of good and evil. Now, God isn't telling Adam not to eat from it because he's a killjoy God. God knows the package deal that, yeah, it may seem pleasurable or right. appealing to gain the knowledge of good and evil, but that knowledge is too heavy of a weight for you mm. to carry. And think about how true this is. Right. Think about the knowledge of evil is the very thing that now we have because we know that not Adam, but Eve took the fruit. But when Adam ate the fruit, um, sin entered in. And so now we all have an awareness of good and evil. And that awareness of evil is a heavy burden to carry. It causes us to be anxious and fearful and all those other things. So yeah, it's very heavy to carry. And honestly, it can cause us to question God. Yeah. The very question of how could a good God let this horrible thing happen? Well, you're right. I mean, it gets right back to the book title. It it's not supposed to be this way. Yeah. Like God didn't design it this way. You know, he didn't, he didn't design us to get cancer diagnosis and, and to have babies die before their parents or to have affairs and addictions and abortion and, you know, all the, the weight mm -hmm. of, of the awareness of sin, the awareness of evil. It's a heavy, heavy weight. And so God says, I want you to experience freedom. So don't, carry don't do this that is going to introduce the weight of the knowledge of good and evil in your life um, and God points out that the suffering is contained as a package deal with the pleasure and I'm going to get back to that in just a minute now I want us to really quickly read one more verse and then we're really going to get into a deeper <laughs> part of the teaching um, I want you to go over to Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, now listen, th this is the enemy quoting God. Mm. So the enemy 
changes the first three words. He does not correctly quote God. He's crafty like that. He is. <laughs> so instead of saying, you are free, hmm. he the enemy doesn't say that. He questions, did God really say? Now look at what he's quoting God. You must not. Ooh, yeah. And so there's a big difference between setting the atmosphere of what you're saying like God did. The purpose of all of this is freedom. You are free. And the enemy tries to totally change the, the atmosphere of what God intended with his command. In other words, the enemy changes it to you must not, which sets an atmosphere of restriction mm -hmm. and that fear of missing out. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? In other words, not only setting an atmosphere of restriction, but making God's restrictions seem too harsh, too severe, and too unrealistic. Yeah. So I think setting the contrast of this gives us great insight into God's relationship with us, a relationship of freedom, and the enemy, uh, his desire to taint that into one of complete restriction. And the enemy is still in the business today doing that same thing. Exactly. He's replacing lies with the truth. And so before you get into more of your teaching, we're going to say goodbye to our Facebook friends. But if you guys are interested, go ahead and click the link in the comments and we would love to see you in the teaching series next week. Bye everybody.